Welcome to Speechless. We're live from uh, Dallas. We got the wrong slide up there. <laughs> but it is the opinion of the host and the guests. So, uh, did the system break down? Uh oh. Well, I'm assuming you can hear me, but uh, hey, there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're live from SPNN in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, just about three blocks from where about 100 or 260 approximately babies were ripped apart from their mother's womb. And I, I bring that up in the aspect of today's show, we're going to talk about parental separation, uh, what the state is doing to parents, uh, how frivolous they are in order to uh, take children from parents. Uh, of course, uh, abortion is the mother deciding that the child will no longer live. Um, but in this case, it's the state coming and saying, parent, uh, you're not fit based on a certain criteria. But we find that criteria is uh, moving. It's not certain. And they can make things up. And, and you're stuck in a system and a process that can literally destroy your life and your child's life. And of course, we've talked about that on this show numerous of times, uh, but you're going to want to hear our guest, Dwight Mitchell, when uh, he comes on a little bit later, uh, because it's another story. It's another Minnesota story, another Minnesota tragedy that uh, has taken place. And fortunately, uh, Dwight Mitchell and others are trying to do something about it and can do something about it. So many parents can't uh, and are trapped. So before we get into that, what's really important in not only this uh, parental separation that is taking place uh, is who's doing the parental separation. And not only is that the whole child protection system, family courts, uh, the family law, the legislature, the executive branch, all the branches are, have put a system together to do this, but the judges do this. They make the final decision, and because of that, you need to know who your judges are. You need to know who's running for office, and you need to know about them and where they stand in relationship to preserving families and keeping fit parents involved in their children's life and not uh, separating children from parents for the financial uh, issues and the financial gain that the state has uh, through doing that and the federal money that's tied into that. So we have elections coming up and there's a primary August 14th. And in Ramsey County, which is really rare, but we have one, two, three seats that have primaries. Okay, and out of those primaries in the general election, you'll get to select two. Or you'll, you'll get to vote for one, but there, you'll have a choice of two. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in these races. First, so get your pens and papers or whatever, your tablets. Uh, you want to write this down. Uh, these are my recommendations. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of history as to why these are my recommendations. So the first primary is in court 11. That was where Gary Bastian retired, and he left that seat open for an election, uh, which, you know, the courts, the governor, they don't like that because they can't put in their person then. It, the people get to put in their person. This is an open seat. Nobody running for this seat has ever been a judge uh, in um, but, they, but they're lawyers, they have to be lawyers by trade. So my recommendation is Greg Egan. And you can find him at www.eganforjudge.com. Uh, there's three other people, Scott Michael Flaherty, Jeffrey Martin, Adam Yang. And depending uh, on how this goes in the, in the primary, I'll make my recommendations uh, for the general election also. But I, through my research and what I like and what I've heard, I'm going with Gregory Egan. Court uh, 20, 
this is an interesting situation. You have Judge Tony Atwal, the incumbent, but you have two people running against him, and I'm going to tell you why that's taking place. But of those two running against him, I go with P. Paul Yang. Uh, and uh, that's at pauljangforjudge.com. <clears throat> and I'll give you some reasons in, in a bit. And then Court 28, uh, Elena Ospie, or Elena Ospie, uh, who's the sitting judge, uh, is challenged by two people. And I'm recommending Calandra Reverie uh, for that seat. And so again, when we get to the generals, I'll give my, there's five seats that are having challengers and I'll also give you my uh, Supreme Court and appellate court picks. But a couple issues are happening here. Uh, one, I, I was just surprised that there were so many seats where attorneys were challenging sitting judges. That's, that's a no-no. You, you don't get to do that unless you get permission from you know, the state bar or uh, other attorneys or law firms in high positions that will finance you, that will say, hey, okay, well, you have our blessing. Okay? If you don't have anybody's blessing uh, and you run against a sitting judge, th those judges will come after you. They'll come after you anyway. You'll start losing cases. It's, it's bad news in our judiciary, the underhanded games that go on. And so that was a question I asked a, a number of these, why? Why is this happening uh, all of a sudden in Ramsey County? And kind of what I got and what I found out, a number of the races, there's uh, former public defenders, or there are public defenders who are running against sitting judges. And kind of my take from what I heard is that these public defenders were not happy with how judges were behaving in the courtroom and how they were making rulings. And what came down was, uh, from on high, was, well, if you don't like it, run for judge. So there's the blessing, <laughs> you know? And so the only thing I can think of is that's what's going on. People have gotten blessings, except there's something else going on in this situation, and there's what's called the Diversity Coalition, and uh, which I think is a, is a great idea. Now, the diver Diversity Coalition is made up of uh, four justices, uh, Anthony L. Brown, running for the appellate court, Calandra Revering, uh, she's one I recommended in uh, um, against Elena, Elena Osby, uh, the sitting judge, uh, Marcus Allman, but he's, he's in the uh, primary, or in the general election, so I haven't talked about him. And then Jeffrey Martin, who's in the primary, but I didn't recommend him, only because I thought Gregory Egan was better in this situation. But if Jeffrey Martin gets to the final, I'm, I'm in with Jeffrey Martin. Okay, so there's a diversity coalition of black people who said, hey, our Ramsey County courts are not diversified enough, and our appellate courts are not diversified enough, so these people decide to run to provide diversity to the courts. So that's something that's going on there. So they have a, a kind of a network, but, but they were kind of uh, disappointed in how uh, either, well, how judges were ruling in the racial issues and and just in relationship to the law and as public defenders or, you know, a lot of things going on. Okay, now there's one other aspect and, and one is the court 20 primary against Judge uh, Tony Atwal. Well, the issue there is Tony Atwal had a DWI or DUI and it was twice the legal limit. It was the second one and so it's, uh, I'm hearing it's kind of an opportunity for at least one of the persons running, hey, let's just run against them, see what happens. Um, but I take Paul Ying as being a serious contender, and uh, that's why I support him. Uh, so anyway, that's my support. That's who I'm recommending. Of course, you have, and you get your own say. And what I like about this is people actually have a say of who's ruling over them. Because 
believe me, at district court level, a judge can make any decision they want. They just have, a, have to have a pretense for following the law. Okay, so again, Gregory Egan uh, in court 11, uh, P. Paul Yang uh, in court 20, and Kalanda Revering in court 28 for the primary. Uh, so it, it's up to you. Nobody else has given you any advice on the judiciary. You, you don't get it. I mean, people don't know. They don't leak, look. They don't do research. They don't know how to do research. And, and so because we don't have much time, I'm just giving you my recommendations and some of the reasons why. I think these are strong family advocates. Uh, and at least with the Diversity Coalition, I know they're looking at the problems with uh, the breakdown of families and don't want to see that happening uh, in their communities. So, uh, and they're not going for the money that they can uh, get in the uh, divorce and child protection services and family law. Okay, well, I'm gonna bring on my guest, Dwight Mitchell, from New Jersey via Minnesota. You get over here a lot. Dwight, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. And the reason I, I'm having you on the show, and I've covered you in a number of press conferences. I played your videos, talked about some of your situation, but I wanted to get you on the show so people can hear from you and go a little bit deeper into your situation. But your children were taken from you by CPS, Child Protection Services, Minnesota. Right. You're from New Jersey. All right, and it took you 22 months to get all of them back. That's correct. So what in the world happened? Well, I was, I'm a management consultant, so I, I travel all over the world uh, doing business process for engineering and change management. Uh, I, I happened to uh, be in Minnesota working for CHS, which is a top okay. 60 organization. So I, I was brought in from New Jersey to do uh, a three-year, $22 million project for CHS. Okay. So uh, You were heading up that project. I was heading up there. I was the program manager, and I had okay. a number of project managers. We were doing 15 sites around the world, and uh, I was leading that effort. Okay. So on long projects uh, such as this, I will bring in uh, a team of project uh, managers and management consultants, and then I will also bring my family with me because okay. I know it's going to be a long-term project. Three years. Yeah. Correct. So, That'd be a lot of traveling back and forth. A lot forth. of traveling back and forth. And when you're starting up a project, I'll do that. But once things solidify, I'll find a house. Uh, so I rented a house in Apple Valley. Uh, okay. And uh, it was a nice house, nice community, uh -huh. quiet. Right. You know. And so I, I brought my family out, and we were uh, uh, living a normal life. My kids were going to school. I was going to CHS daily and traveling around for that, going back and forth between uh, my office in New Jersey and here. I call it a reverse commute, so, so okay, to speak. Okay, sure. You know? uh, and uh, my, my middle son at the time uh, just, just wasn't behaving. Mm -hmm. um, I guess he had, he had sort of taken it upon himself to say, I don't, I don't have to listen to you, Dad. Okay. Um, so. Uh, that happens to a lot of kids. I, I suppose it does. <laughs> you know, know? I mean, I, what, what kid doesn't kind of, huh? You know, I, do I want to listen to my parents? You know, how far can I push it? Right. You know, and can I go as far as saying I don't want to listen? Right. And right. parents, you know, you know this happens all the time. <laughs> so. Well, it, it, it had gotten so, you know, so difficult with Xander is that uh, I, I had said to him, he, he wouldn't do his chores. And I just said, well, if you don't want to do your chores, you know, I'm not going to give you your allowance, and if, mm -hmm. you know, so you, you won't be able to do anything. And, and so I, we were talking about that, and I said, so in other words, you're telling me that uh, if I don't tell you to, to do your chores, you're not going to do them? He says, pretty much. <laughs> and he okay. looked me right in the eye and said, yeah. and I just said, wow. I said, well, if, if that's the way you feel, on top of that, I said, you know, there's no Xbox, you know, there's no PlayStation. Sure. Said, um, that, that's going away. So I, I guess in retaliation, he decides, well, I'm not going to do anything in school. So I'm, wow. I'm thinking he's doing his homework every day, and the teacher calls me to school. And she says, well, he hasn't done any work in the last six weeks. You know, so he hadn't done any of his homework or anything of that nature. Uh -huh. So there were, there were a number of things going on in the household. Mm -hmm. 
and so uh, it finally came to a head. And uh, I, you know, you know, after the talking and the timeout and you know the taking away of his toys sure. and the Xbox and all of these things, I said, well, you know, I, I have one last resort. Mm -hmm. you know? And so he was 10 years old at the time, and and so. Uh, I took it upon myself to use what I thought was, you know, ordinary corporal punishment. Like, I give him a, a, a bottom spanking that, okay. you know, temporary, you know, pain. And it's legal. And it's legal. Right. So what was interesting is that Minnesota says that you are allowed to spank your children. So it's, it's and, unless you get into the courts. Unless and, you get into the courts. And then all of a sudden that law is meaningless. It's totally meaningless. It's totally subjective to the judge. That, that is correct. Well, no, not even to the judge, to the oh. social worker. Okay. It's even right. at a low, the bar is so low, and I, so I was, I, was, I was surprised. I'm like, well, how can you say it's, it's legal? And they actually said to me, oh, it's legal as long as you don't cause any pain. And well, I'm that's like, not the law. Well, it, when, is you, it? when you look at the statutes, no, when you look at the statutes, I was, I was, I was shocked. So you, when you start going through the statutes, they have manipulated the statutes in such a way. And when I say they, I'm talking about uh, DHS, Department of Human okay. Services, because you know, they get into these sessions, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a few minutes, because I was going to the task force for child prevention. I was speaking before the committee, so I was speaking to the, the senators and the representatives. Oh. And I, I was trying to understand like what was going on, because I didn't uh, I didn't feel that the, the statutes were written correctly. I'm like, how can you say it's legal to do something on one hand and then charge a parent in the other? So then when I, I started looking at the statutes, they, the statutes are crafted that anything less than substantial bodily harm is, con is considered malicious punishment. And then so well, what's, the different, what's the definition of that? Well, anything that causes an injury, what's the definition of injury? Well, anything that causes pain or the threat of pain. So the threat of pain. The threat of pain. So I was they were trying to charge me with terroristic threats because I had told my son that if you get expelled from school that I'm I'm, I'm going to give you a spanking, you know. And they said, "Well, you can't say that to a child." I said, "Well, then what's going to stop him from doing whatever he wants to do or, or getting expelled from school?" And I said, "I'm trying to to make my son a productive member of society." I said, he needs to go to school, he needs to go to get education, he needs to respect authority. I said, what, do I wait till he's 18 years old and let a police officer hit him upside the head with a billy club and say, you need to respect authority? So there was this- But did they give you, well, do this instead, or did they give you any recommendations as to how to fix the problem? Oh, talking in time out. But you were doing that. I know. And, and I said, and I asked him, I said, so what else was I supposed to do? I said, you know, my own son told you that, you know, his Xbox had been taken away and he had been given, you know, extra schoolwork. So I went to Barnes and Nobles and bought all these extra books and I said, this is what you're going to be doing. I said, you know, I said, you're not going to just be sitting around idle, so you're going to be doing extra schoolwork since you aren't doing your, your work in school and you're behind. So I said, you need to catch up now. Okay. And, um, and they, wouldn't, they couldn't give me an answer. Sure. They said, well, well you, have you tried therapy? And I'm like, well, that's two hundred fifty dollars an hour. I said, "Are you going to pay for for therapy mm -hmm. at two hundred fifty dollars an hour?" I said, "There's nothing wrong with my son." Mm -hmm. I said, "He's just doing what kids what do." What kids do, you know. And but doing what parents do, healthy parents, right? You know, when they recognize the problems, that isn't okay for the state. But what, what's 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 really interesting now, as it relates to children. Um, and, and the way all the children are, are behaving in the United States is that you sit here, the teachers say we can't do anything. The teachers are afraid of the principals. Right. The principals are afraid of the superintendent. Right. The superintendent is afraid of the school board. The school board is afraid of the parents, and the children aren't afraid of anyone. Right. So, you know, they're sitting here yeah. like, well, what are you going to do to me? Yeah. You know, you can't do anything to me. I received from the school a listing of things that I could not do as a parent. You know, it says you cannot send your child to bed without dinner as punishment. You cannot have him stand in the corner. You cannot, you know, degrade him. You cannot spank him. So they gave me a list of things I could do. And I said, well, then uh, how do you expect me to uh, uh, get my child to listen to me? 
And that is a key problem mm -hmm. that is going on in society right now. There's this 30-year-old social experiment that's been going on right. with, you know, there's no discipline. We've taken discipline completely out of our society. And I tell everyone, I says, go back 30 years ago. And I said, if you go back 30 years ago, we didn't have Columbine. We didn't have, you know, all of the things that we've sort of taken for granted now that, that have become normalized. Mm -hmm. I said, these things weren't going on. I said, mm -hmm. what has changed? I said, the only thing that has changed in our society is we've completely taken discipline out of our society. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, what I went through. Yeah, so you disciplined your child, and then what happened? Um, what, what, how did the wrath of the state come down upon you? Uh, the police actually came and took the three children out of my house. Well, how'd they find out about you spanking your child? My uh, middle child told the babysitter, and he told the babysitter that his mother said, and when I said his mother, his original mother, I was remarried. Okay. So uh, his, his biological mother mm -hmm. said that if I ever spanked him, to call the police. Okay. And so um, this was the first time he got spanked. He told the babysitter who in turn did exactly what he said and, mm -hmm. and, and my former wife said. Mm -hmm. So the police came to the house and they, they took all the children to the police station and social services met them at the police station and they said, we're, we're taking your children mm -hmm. and putting them in foster care. That, that exact same Did thing. they have a, a warrant? They did not have a warrant. How did they come in the house? They just, they just came in. It was, it was kind of interesting because I went to court ab about that uh, because they were uh, taking pictures and uh, examining the house. I said, well, no one gave you permission to do that. And so when I went to court for that, the judge actually said, did you tell them to leave? And I'm like, no, they said they were coming in. So the judge said, well, you never told them to leave. I said, well, they didn't ask. They said what they were doing. He says, well, then you gave them permission because you never told them to leave. Uh, who was this judge? Uh, I'd have to go go look at the okay. records. I always like the names of judges. I, I can get it for you because <laughs> yeah, I, I have the court it. transcript, so I'll, I'll, okay. I'll give it to you. But yeah. it, it was the most interesting thing I'd ever heard. You were in Dakota County? Dakota County. Dakota yes, County, was. folks. Have we heard of that name before or on this show? How bad it is out there? Yeah, we have. Okay. <laughs> so. It's a sideline. It's, there's a lot of history uh, with Dakota County and Ramsey County and a number of counties, but that's one that comes up that uh, is really messing up big time. First Judicial mm -hmm. District. I, I, I don't doubt it because they didn't do anything as prescribed by state statutes or the law. So there is a timeline in a child protection proceeding. So there, and mm -hmm. there's a number of things that are supposed to be done. Um, and in my particular case, uh, Dakota County did not follow one of the timelines. That they did not do anything that they were supposed to do. So. When, they, when a, a child is removed from the home, you're supposed to have what is known as an emergency hearing right. before the court in 72 hours, which is, which is three days. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get mine until 10 days after my children were removed. And did the court or the uh, Child Protection Services say why you got, why it waited that long? Well, they just asked. It was, just, it was kind of interesting because I didn't know that at the time. I, I found this out later on. They just said, uh, Your Honor, we'd like the hearing on this day. And the judge said, okay. It was literally, and I have the letter. So it's a letter uh -huh. where they, they, they asked the court that we'd did like to have. Did you have any say in that? I did not. They just granted it anyway. That, that is correct. Yeah, well, that's not the first time we've heard of that from Dakota County, so. Well, what makes my case very, very unique uh, is that uh, from the beginning, I thought that the entire proceedings were, were unconstitutional, and, I, and I, didn't, I didn't feel that things were being done proper. Mm -hmm. uh, so about two months into my case, I asked for all of my discovery, meaning I had said, start sending me all of the court records. Okay. And so uh, every few months, I would say, is there any additional discovery? So at the end of my case, I, I had over 600 pages of discovery from Dakota County. So unlike most uh, citizens who go through this ringer, well, I had all the documentation that related to my case. Okay. Uh, now, Dakota is famous for not giving documentation. That's correct. Did you have a problem? I did not, you know, okay. and, and it, it, it's probably because of their arrogance. So they thought that, uh, you know, so what, you want your paperwork? Here you go. What are you okay. going to do? 
Right. And, All right. and so sure. there, there was this arrogance that we can do what, whatever we want to do. And so I would say things to them and they would just like, I don't care. You know, we're going to do exactly what we want to do. And okay. so they actually did that for about 22 months. Um, and so uh, when I finally had my say in court, which was 22 months later. It took you 22 months to get your say it in took court? 22 you have, months to get a hearing. You didn't even have your 10-day? Did you have your... I had the 10-day. Okay. And, so, and the judge ruled in their favor because what most people don't realize is that <clears throat> CPS does not have to prove that you did anything wrong. They yeah. just have to make allegations. Right. And technically, they have 90 days to put their case together and present it to the court and say, well, here are the facts. Here's so the evidence. In 10 days, it's the allegations they put together. That is correct. Don't have to have any evidence, any foundation to their evidence or anything. Just a prima facie. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then after 10 days, then they're supposed to have 90 days for you to get into court. That is correct. For them, to, for them to compile the evidence, to put a case against you, to tell the judge, you know, why your children are in need of protection or services, or they're supposed to return the children to you. Okay. So, no notice of a hearing in 90 days? No. Or anything? So they kept asking for an extension after extension after extension. So you had court date scheduled? I, I, had a, I went to court every month for 22 months for, for a hearing. You know, and it was always some reason why we couldn't have it. And now, you know, was this before a different judge or the same judge that uh, denied the 72-hour hearing? Well, it's before a different judge, and this is one of the things that uh, I I thought it, this is a major breakdown in in Dakota County. I'm not sure it is in, in other counties. Certain certain uh, members of our organization have said they had the same judge throughout the entire proceeding. I had right. a different judge every time I went. So there was this rotating schedule. And what they don't do is they don't have a checklist of saying, well, what is due now? So the prior judge would order something. Uh -huh. We'd come to court. There'd be another judge. And they wouldn't do something. For example, in my case, I never got a reunification plan. So there were 22 right. months, no reunification plan. And they're plan. supposed to. And they're supposed to. And the judge ordered it multiple times. On three occasions, I have court orders where he said, you will give this man a reunification plan and you will you know, put his son back in the household. So the reunification plan is done by Child Protection Service. That is correct. And the guardian ad litem. And the guardian. And mm -hmm. they did nothing? They did nothing. Never wrote one up. In, in July of 2014, the judge was so upset that he said, I expect a reunification plan in this chamber in the next 30 days. I expect it to be signed by Mr. Mitchell, the foster parent, social worker, the guardian at Lida, and Mr. Mitchell's son. Okay. 30 days later come, we go to court. Same judge? Different judge. No reunification okay. plan. See, and, and you're bringing up one of the strategies because you, you'll, I mean, this is Dakota County, a lot of counties, but I've seen this in Dakota County. A judge will do the right thing say everything right but the intention is to throw you off think okay things are going to happen the intention is to throw you off and behind the scenes they're telling people leave it alone you know right. and because right. well i'll just get another judge in here you know and they'll it, it's that uh, it's kind of a cat and mouse game that goes on so they'll put something and they'll say something from the bench. They may even put it in order, but what we see a lot of times they change their orders from what they've said on the bench. Mm -hmm. And um, so the whole purpose is, is what uh, one person told me, or two people actually, the whole purpose is to keep you coming back so you give in. And so you just drag it out and then finally you say, all right, I'm done, you know. And every month you got to come back. Every so. month I was back for 22 months. And so what ended up happening, and I, I suppose maybe I, I was the wrong person to, to, to pick on because uh, I played a lot of sports growing up, and so I was very competitive. Sure. Um, I was the uh, uh, 97 AMA 
a national motorcycle road racing champion. Okay. So I, I raced all over the world. I raced the Isle of Man TT races three times. I was uh, a competitive fencer in foil. I won the silver medal in New Jersey Olympics, was going for the national team. So, <clears throat> well, now you know what the courts will say about you. You have delusions of grandeur. Maybe they, maybe they will. You know, <laughs> we've had that happen. Okay, it gives us work history. But I, and I, then they throw them in a psych ward. I had to go in there and say these are true. You're throwing him in a psych ward for true things. That's right. That's right. But anyway, I, I digress. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have do that. But I just here's the next. So you you're an athlete. You understand perseverance. Yes. You understand strategy you understand sticking to it you well, know tomorrow I, I wasn't given up day. was it wasn't given no. up and so what was very very interesting is that so this went on uh until november mm -hmm. and so in november they come to court and they ask the judge well your honor the reunification plan isn't working we'd like to stop the reunification plan and i'm like wait what reunification plan i've never gotten a reunification plan Oh my goodness. And so the judge grants them permission to stop the reunification efforts. But I'm like, Your Honor, there were never any reunification efforts. Now, here's the most and interesting And this is a different part. judge? Different judge. Now, the reunification plan, along with the case plan, are both to be submitted to the court. The case plan is what needs to happen in order for the child to come back into the home. The okay. reunification plan is what therapy or what additional things are you know do we need to make sure you know transpires to get that child back into the home well in my case the case plan was never written and never submitted to the court so that was supposed to happen in 30 days there was never a case plan there was never a unification plan so i'm sitting here going like judge after judge after judge for 22 months never saw a case plan never saw a reunification plan and every single thing that CPS said or recommended, the judge granted verbatim. I mean, it was like if you look at their requests and recommendations and you look at the judge's order, they, it was like CPS was running the, 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 uh, the, the courtroom right. instead of the judge. Right. And no matter what objection we made, it was just like, note it. All right, CPS, you can have what you want. Note it. Okay, CPS, you can have what you want. <laughs> It was not one of our objections were, were upheld, not, not one. Wow. So uh, the net result of all this is you're fighting this battle, and then why did you get your kids back in 22 months? <coughs> it, it, since nothing was working. Right. Why didn't they keep your kids forever? Because they, they had you. I, I mean, they, I mean, Everything they wanted to do was happening. What happened? Well, what, what ended up happening is that I, I became very fr frustrated uh, you know, with my attorney. Um, I, I, I let my attorney go for ineffective counsel. And I said, well, I'm paying you. I had one of the top law firms in, um, in Minnesota. Okay. It was Walling, uh, Berg, and Deebly. Okay. And I'm, I'm paying an exorbitant amount of money every single month. Mm -hmm. And nothing was happening. Uh, and so I let them go for ineffective counsel, and I decided to proceed pro se. Okay. So uh, I had all of my discovery. I went through all 600 pages of discovery. I looked at what was being said. I looked at what was actually happening in actuality. I looked at their own case notes, and I guess they didn't expect someone to do that or to actually go to that level of detail. So um, I wrote, uh, I filed three motions with the court, you know, I filed a motion to dismiss. I filed a, a motion to vacate all previous orders, and uh, I filed a motion to enforce my New Jersey court orders, my custody court orders. And then I wrote a memorandum of law. Well, now, <clears throat> did your attorneys do any of that before? No, they did not. No. Oh, wow. No. Well, a motion to dismiss is like automatic. Well, it, I mean, that's it's not automatic. First thing. So, well, yeah. I, no, no, no. No, what you're saying is you would think it would be easy. In no, no I, court, I'm saying that's the kind of one of the first things you're supposed to do. It's a little harder in family court, but mostly civil matters. Anyway, well, yeah. you know, what, what I was more trying to say. That, no, 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 no. You're right, Tim. What I was trying to say to you, which even perplexed me, which I didn't understand, 
you only have until the admit deny hearing to file a motion to dismiss oh, wow. in family court. You didn't get one. Well, no, I got an admit deny hearing, but what happens okay. is it happens days. anywhere between three and seven days, right? So it, it's a separate hearing, and they can combine them with the, uh, with the uh, emergency hearing. Sure. So what ends up happening for, for most people is that if you have your admit deny hearing within seven days of the whole proceeding starting, you're still trying to find a lawyer yeah. in the first seven days. Right. You get a lawyer, you get representation, you go to court, you have passed your timeline to file your motion to dismiss. Which you bring up an interesting thing there because you go down, to, you, you, one goes down the legislature and people are saying, hey, my kids are taken away, we need to get it done quickly. Right. But they don't realize that that also can work against you. Right. Because you got to find somebody to help you through that system right away, and you better have some money. You better have five to ten grand to put down on the spot. Right. And there's no public defender for these. No. Because it's not a crime. No. It's all. And you simple. get your take. You get your children taken away, and it's over before it even started. It is. So anyway, finish. <laughs> so I, I ended up. I, I filed this, and, and so in my memorandum of law, I did a chronology of everything that was supposed to take place and everything that happened. And I submitted 84 pages of Dakota County official documentation. And I put together a matrix. Uh -huh. And I said, here's the state statute. Here's the timeline. Here's what was supposed to happen. And here's what actually happened. And then here's what social services said. And so when I put all this together, I go to court. I have my hearing. The judge looks at you know, you know, my memorandum of law. And so while we're having the hearing, the judge says, Mr. Mitchell, you, you did this per, pro se? And I said, yes, I did. She says, well, I'm, I'm very well briefed, she said. Okay. She said, you know, you did a very, very good job on this. And I just said, thank you, Your Honor. I said, I'm just stating the facts. And so what was fascinating is that nothing in my memorandum was contradicted by social work by social services. Okay. They said nothing. They were silent. Wow. And so the judge said, I need to look at all this. He says, I'm going to set this aside for 30 days. She said, I need you to come back in 30 days. Now, oh. I'll have my ruling at that time. Now, that had to be scary. You know. Another 30 days. <laughs> it, it was scary, but I was, I was confident because I know and I, I had And this was a presented. Dakota County judge? Yes. And it was, it was Judge Erica McDonald. Okay. And so, Who's now a U.S. attorney. Yes. Yes, okay. she is. All right. So, uh, from Minnesota. So she, she she looked at everything, and so we we come to court in 30 days. Well, who's in court but my son, who I hadn't seen in 22 months. Uh huh. And before court started, the judge said, "Are, are there any you know motions or you know does the does the county want to say anything before we get started?" And the county said, "Well, Your Honor, we'd like to uh, withdraw our our motion for termination of parental rights." We'd like to dismiss all charges against Mr. Mitchell, and we're going to return his son to him, and his son is in the courtroom today, and we're, we're giving him back his son. And I said, wait, wait, wait. The judge needs to rule on my three motions. And the judge says, well, they're moot now. You, you have your son back. Oh, my god. So there, there's no reason for me to rule. You know? That's a scam. And so she was part. McDonald was part of the, uh, Erica McDonald was part of that scam. Uh, to, in my book, I, I I can't speak to it because if you look at the transcripts, I asked her three times. I says, I says, no, Your Honor. I said, I need a ruling. I said, I have been, you know, labeled as a child abuser. You have put me in your state record, so I'm in your database now. You know, based upon these allegations, what most people don't realize and. and completely took me by storm is I'm put in the state database. Every single person who has an allegation against them is put into the state database before they even have a trial, within the first two weeks, just from a reporting. So I'm, I was sitting here saying, well, who did the assessment? Oh, the social worker. Well, how can she, you know, have a finding before we even go into court? The judge hasn't looked at it. The judge hasn't looked at any evidence, so you are put into the state's database purely based upon allegations that are unsubstantiated by the social worker. And this goes on every single day, and it's been going on. Well, this happened to me in 2014, and it's still going on today in, in, in 2018. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 
So my kid, that's how I got my kids back, but it was only my own uh, tenacity, my own fortitude. And I, I'm like, I'm tired of this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not messing with your legal system. I mean, I read what I'm able to do, I put it together, and I got my kids back. So, uh, you know, Which I, is rare. It's, it's rare. rare. It's rare. It's rare because most people give in. They will, right. they will submit. Yeah, you know. and when their lawyer tells them, this is what has to happen, and this is the way it happens, and most people don't go beyond that. Well, they think their lawyers are telling them the truth, and so what I've, right. what I've been telling uh, everyone in our, in our group and organization is that uh, the best thing you can do for the first 90 days is to keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And I said, when I, and I, I'm not being facetious, no. I'm like, do not sign any of their documents. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, I can show you the state statutes and the DHS manual where they say you do not have to cooperate with DHS. They have to do their own assessment. They trick people and force them. If you don't do this, you won't get your kids back. Well, that's not what the law says and that's not what the state statute says. It says the social worker is entitled to an investigation. The parents do not have to help. You do not have to sign any medical records or anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. The only thing you have to do is allow them uh, to, uh, if they want to, look at your, your child's medical records, well, the court can give them permission to do that. You don't have to give them permission to do that. Right. So I tell everyone, okay. this is an adversarial relationship. Think of yourself, you know, that, that's the prosecutor, you're the defense. In what legal court system does the defense go and, and help the prosecutor and say, whoa, let me give you all this information, Mr. Right. Prosecutor, to, right. to, you know, to use however you oh, want to see fit. Oh, but it's civil, so it's not a pro but it is a prosecution. Right, you know. And it's a conflict of interest. You right. can't say that the same person who's in charge of prosecuting you for, for alleged abuse is the same person who's in charge of reunifying you. I mean, their, their goal, oh, yeah. I took the child, I'm taking your child. Why should I, you know, play a contradictory role and say, now I'm going to help you, you know, get your child back. Right. No, you can't do both. And so that inherently hmm. creates an issue within the system. And this is why so many parents are having problems now because the social worker will say, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, do this for you and help you get your child back. And I was the same victim. Mm -hmm. So I believed the social worker, you know, after the initial investigation was done, you know, the social worker said, here's what we're going to do. And I did everything he said, and then after I got my discovery, I started seeing what was going on behind the background. He was actually lying to me. He was lying to me, he was lying to my son, and I have it documented. He was telling my son that I abandoned him, that I didn't want him. Oh, well, he was telling me, that's oh, abuse. your son doesn't that's want to abuse. go home. I can tell him, I'll, I will send you the documents. You know? Wow. As a matter of fact, I don't have to send them to you. Just go online, look at, look at the complaint I file, mm -hmm. and it, it's in the complaint. If you go to my website, or if you go to our Facebook page, it's, okay. it's there. So anybody that wants to, to look at it, don't believe me. Every single document was filed with my federal complaint. Wow. Okay. So. I'm in a dilemma right now. Sorry. The, the, this history of all this is totally fascinating. We can finish out the whole show going over more history <laughs> and stuff like that. But I think we need to switch it because you started an organization. We've got to get this out. I mean, people... You want to know about this organization. You may need help. Uh, you, you, there's a lot to know. But um, so you started an organization because of what you went for, went through. Can, what, what can you tell us about your organization? What's the name? You well, know? the name of the organization is Stop CPS from Legally Kidnapping Children. And I, I started the organization uh, sort of as therapy initially I mean, because you know, I went through a lot, and I, you know, I wanted to see, was I the only one going through this? Right. Um, and then I started talking to people, and I found out other people were going through the same thing. And, and then at that time, we had about 250 members, and we were talking about what they went through, and I was sharing my experience. Um, and then um, I decided to, to, to go to the next step and uh, to enlarge the organization, and, and I created an association. Um, and the, the goal was to try and affect change. So that okay. was our, our ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, we, we got about 12, 13 minutes left for oh, you really? to tell the rest of what you want to tell. <laughs> so I, I'm just giving you a warning. It goes fast here. I realize that. So what, do you have a mission statement? What are your goals? Uh, we do. We're, we, we have a national litigation strategy going on right now. We, so we filed uh, a federal 
uh, lawsuit um, in Minnesota a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we feel that the state statutes are unconstitutional, they're vague and overbroad, and it allows uh, child protection services to unnecessarily separate children from their family, which creates a lifelong trauma. Um, as evidenced by what's going on uh, with the uh, Mexican border incident and all the doctors and, and everyone is talking about, oh. you know, what separation from the uh, from illegal does. immigrants, but just separation of parent and child, and they're screaming about it. But everyone that's screaming about this, and people you need to know, every person that's screaming is saying it's okay to do it to an American citizen and to an American family. That's correct. You know, that, uh, uh, and the they, and they set up a system to do that. That is correct. And it, it's systematic. And it's a self-preserving system. It's, it's, an, it's an ecosystem that is self-protecting. Uh, 465,000 children were taken uh, as of the last reporting. It came out in October of 2017. By child one, protection By child protection services okay. nationally. Uh, $29.1 billion was spent. Uh, if you go to my website, I have links to the U.S. Department of uh, uh, Health and Human Services, their annual reporting. I went back to 1999, and I, so I added it up, and I said, you know, and I just did 10 years. You know, I said, well, I don't need to go back to 1999. I'll just do the last 10 years, and it was like over $290 billion. So it's a machine now. Right. And so it's a self-protecting machine. And so the doctors, the judges, the lawyers, the guardian at litems, if you go look at the, uh, the Title IV Social Security Act and what the money can be spent on, Correct. everyone is being paid. So it, it's, you know, people talk about money. I'm like, people, don't listen to me. Go to my website, go to the DHS right. website, look at what's, being, what's out there. So it's readily available. No one knows about it. And it's one of these, you know, closely guarded secrets. So I've, I've sort of opened up Pandora's box. Right. Well, I, I, in Minnesota, I know our legislatures, no, legislators know about that. They mm -hmm. know about the money. They know about the system. The judges know about it. The, the people in, in power know about it because they perpetuate the machine. Sure. There are some legislators fighting. And you mentioned you've talked to some legislators. Do you I have. care to say who's kind of helping you? Or, uh, or is there legislation out there at all that's... Well, you know... It's it's a it's a slow process right now, and I'm sure I'm I'm, uh, I'm not going to really talk about legislature. Okay. I'm more because I tried that route, uh -huh. and and that after two years of trying to talk to them, I said that's not going to work. Okay. I said you know I have to go the federal route, and that's why I went the okay. federal route, and that's why we, we we put in this this lawsuit because after two years of looking at, at the legislation, they actually made it worse instead of better. Right. More children were taken in the last two and three years that were taken in subsequent years. So Minnesota is completely out of control now wow. um, as it relates to taking care of children. And what's even more outrageous is that the parents don't, don't get uh, uh, an attorney. The children don't get a t an attorney unless they're over 10 years old. And the majority of children are under 10 years old that, that CPS has in their custody. And you don't get a jury trial for a termination of parental rights. So a thief who steals a pack of chewing gum mm -hmm. is entitled to an evidentiary hearing. A sculptory information has to be provided by the prosecutor. Right. And they get a jury trial right. for stealing a pack of gum. Right. You get your child taken forever. Right. And you get none of this. So that is, you it's, know, it's wrong. It's it's immoral. It's a, it's outrageous. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, but they they uh, in my understanding, the, this was perfected through the family law system, and yes. then they keep transferring and find out what works and what people can't resist, and and then they build that into other systems. Well, and, it's Einstein's. You know, if you look at it, you look at uh, you know, Einstein was was a brilliant person. But one of the things he gave us is is the definition of insanity. <laughs> it's like to keep doing the same things again and again, expecting different results. So, you know, everyone talks about it. It's talked about in the U.S. Congress. It's talked about mm -hmm. in all the states. And they keep doing the same thing. They understand what's wrong. Right. And they expect something to change. Well, it's not going to change. Social services needs to be abolished in its current form. Mm -hmm. It needs to go away, and it needs to be completely reorganized and restructured. But what's that going to do? That whole ecosystem? 
at, at $29, $30 billion a year. Well, I actually think it's more, but I'm only using their reports. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it all goes away. And everybody's like, oh, what are you going to do? I says, it doesn't need to go away. You need to transfer it. You need to go to the preventive side. You need to look at foster care. And if you look at the statistics for foster care, they're abysmal. The children that are going into foster care are just horrible. Oh, my mm -hmm. goodness. I didn't mean to have that on. <laughs> I didn't warn you. My mm -hmm. fault. I usually mention it. I usually turn it off. <laughs> I, I apologize. No, that's all right. So, you know, if you look what at What would a show be without it? So. <laughs> at least one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um... Back, back to the foster care system, because yeah. I think it's very, very important that everyone knows and understands this, is that 50% um, of the children that, that age out of foster care at 18 uh, don't have a high school diploma. 3% mm -hmm. uh, of the children in foster care go to, go to college. Within the first year, 60% of the children who age out or are 18 in foster care are either dead or in jail. Wow. Twenty percent of the children that age out are automatically homeless. The minute they the minute they age out, they have nowhere to go, no mm -hmm. home. Because foster care doesn't pay the families anymore. Doesn't pay the families anymore. You're 18. You gotta you gotta make do. Now, mind you, no education and you can't go to college. So what are you supposed to do? So then you look at the penal system, right? Seventy-five percent of the people in the penal system were future foster children. 85% of the, of the inmates on death row were future foster children. Mm -hmm. Our foster care system has failed our country miserably. Mm -hmm. And these statistics are not new. I can go back. You can look on my website. This is a 10-year span. It was going on for the last 20, and no one is doing anything about it. So it's okay for us to harm, damage, traumatize, and destroy our own children. Right. But... 11 million, uh, 11,000 immigrants. Oh, no. Oh, we're, oh my goodness. Well, all children are, are, are priceless. All right. children are sacred. In the last 10 years, I added up all of the children that were taken and, and put into foster care. It was over 2 million children went into foster care. So we have effectively, as a nation, destroyed 2 million children. If only 3% went to college, and became effective members of our society out of two million children. Mm -hmm. That that speaks volumes. So right. that's why I'm on this crusade, Tim. Yeah. Well, you mentioned you have a federal lawsuit. Is there a hearing coming? Has that been scheduled yet? A hearing? Or? Yes. The, the the first hearing has been scheduled for October third. The, the wheels of justice move slowly. Uh, it, you know, we filed Some of the it complaint. with reason, but not what you went through in Dakota County. But no. people need to have a chance to answer. That's correct. And, and so get the, the, the complaints. The county out. has it because so. we have a motion against uh, our complaints against both the county and the state. Uh -huh. So the state has to answer, the county has to answer. We have to respond. They get to counter respond, and it's like days, but it's like twenty right. days between each. So right, yeah. You know, people are like, well, what's going on? I'm like, well, guys. It takes a long time because time. each side has to go back and forth. But we do have a date. Okay. And so. And that could be potentially continued, but less likely. In federal less court. likely. I don't, I don't think it they will don't be. don't play around so much no. there. However, no. you see that happen at sometimes. But okay. Uh, you have some slides. Oh. Did we get those? I, I, I did give them the slides. You know. Okay. Uh, so what's this one about here? That, that can you see on this TV? Oh. That's right. We, we started a fundraiser a couple of days ago. So what we're trying to do uh, as part of our mission statement, we, we want to have all the children represented. Uh -huh. So our fundraiser is, is for pro bono attorneys, family counseling, uh, trauma treatment. And so we are trying to expand to all 50 states. Uh -huh. We want offices. We want a 1-800 call line. And our fundraiser uh, will allow us to do this. So it's it's all laid out on the website. The fundraiser's on Facebook, so we don't get charged any fees, or you can just donate on our website mm -hmm. to, to help save a traumatized child. Okay. Let's go to the next graphic here. That was the uh, statistics yeah. that okay. talks about the, the 437,465 children that were moved. That's on my website also. So anybody that wants to, to see those statistics and the government sites, you know, just just go look at that on our website. Okay. Next slide. That is our logo that's uh, on our Facebook page. So we have a, a Facebook 
a fan page and we have a, a, a group page. So the group page is for victims. We currently have 3,700 members. So we've, we went Whoa. from 250 to 3,700 in about 90 days. Wow. Uh, and it's growing. We get about 25 or plus people a day asking to join. So mm -hmm. uh, it, the word is spreading like wildfire. And so there's a lot of victims out there who need help. Mm -hmm. I noticed you mentioned family preservation first. I that's, mean, that's correct. A, that's a big thing, but you, you've stated why, because you get kids in the foster care system, but that's your major thing. Well, the, all the studies will show you that the children, you know, are, are faring far worse in the foster care system than the whole reason they were taken out of the household in the first place. So the emphasis needs to be put on the front mm -hmm. in prevention rather than on the backside, because the backside is failing miserably. Okay. Let's go to the next uh, slide. This is your logo. This right? is our logo. Okay. And so I show you the, both the Facebook and Twitter um, symbol. If you go to the at CPS LKC on either Facebook or Twitter, that will take you to our page. Okay. And then it, our website is the same. It's our initials. It's scpslck.org. Okay. So the main thing you're trying to do with your organization is what? We are trying to reunite we call it rescuing. We are trying to rescue the children from the clutches of CPS and reunite them with their families. And we're also trying to prevent the separation. So we're, we're assisting parents when CPS gets involved, we're saying, here's what you need to do. And we'd like to be able to present them with counsel that understands what needs to happen and who's not just trying to build a client or the, the uh, uh, defense lawyers that are, you know, uh, that are appointed by the court yeah. that have no incentive yeah. to fight for a client's civil rights. Okay. Dwight, the hour's up. Wow, that was fast. It goes fast, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I really appreciate you being on the show today, uh, Dwight Mitchell. And folks, I, I just want you to know, uh, remember, remember this. If you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? That's correct. Right. And one, you, thank Dwight for standing up for his, you know, because sometimes people won't do that for you. And also, good men don't do nothing. And Dwight, you're a good man because you're doing something about this. Thank you. So, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, so, please, please do God bless.